Hey everyone, thank you for joining the session today. We're going to be talking about what it means to bridge your automotive telematic solution with the cloud. What that means is uh, what's presented here will give you the building blocks you need to design your next generation telematic system that's secure, scalable, and highly available. So, my name is Richard Alberger, and I'm excited to be your speaker for this session today. I've had a few different roles at Amazon, but I have been doing embedded development and IoT evangelism for building solutions on top of AWS for the last several years. Now today, I'm really excited to demonstrate some of the work we've been doing in the Meta AWS project while pairing that with some of the AWS cloud services. So when I work on the are the possible here, I work with a lot of different types of hardware, which is pretty exciting. It could be the Renaissance R car. I have some props, so like this guy right here, which is the starter kit, um, or the TI Jacinto J7. I have one lying around here. It's a little bit bigger. Or um, the Qualcomm 8155P board, which is here. Um, I wanted to show you the 820A, but I can't find it right now. Um, so also, oh, one more thing. Um, when you have the Renaissance R card with the Kingfisher board, this is what it looks like. So we'll be using the, that a little bit later. Um, so I also work with some peripherals, like some um, trivial GPS peripherals, like this guy right here, which you'll see a lot of later. And uh, also there's, on the little bit more expensive or high end is the Parker Lord GNSS sensor, um, which provides like really precise data. But in any case, uh, I can use these in a wide variety of situations that pair uh, with things that I'm developing in the AWS cloud. But today I'm focusing on automotive, so um, why don't we go ahead and get started with that? So, we're first going to kick off with the why today. Why do we care about pairing telematics in the cloud? What are we trying to achieve here? After some time with that, um, by talking through a story I'll share, we'll go a bit deeper and understand both the edge and the cloud components. Um, those are the com components that we'll need to be successful with the pairing between the edge and the, and the cloud. Now, once we have that understood, we can bubble this up one level higher, and we can visualize how the cloud and um, edge components work together end to end. And at the end, we'll top that off with a demonstration that shows the Renaissance R car working with the AWS cloud. So um, look, telematics is Nothing new. Uh, things like data loggers have been around for some time now, and many benefits have been realized by that. So why do we need to stretch it to the cloud? When we get into it, you'll see it's not a stretch, but it's certainly not trivial to achieve. So whether you're running a delivery service or a car rental agency, or maybe a trucking fleet, you're concerned with telematics. Where are your assets, meaning like where are your vehicles? Um, how are they tracking? Are they throwing diagnostic trouble codes? Um, is the driver on schedule? So let's break that down a bit. Previous to connected telematics, you relied on data loggers, right, to record telematic information. You were able to review that information when the asset came back to home base, right? It could be when the refrigerant truck got parked at the distribution center for the night, that seemed pretty good. Um, but of course, there's more opportunity for um, advancement and optimization for sure. Or wide area communications are advancing and they're getting faster and smarter as well. Uh, cloud technologies are becoming more pervasive and the resources you can use with that uh, on are more on demand and at least for AWS, and you pay for only what you use. So now we can truly create that single pane of glass, right? That's what we want to achieve when we're managing large amounts of fleets. 
the one um, where to have that pane of glass where you can see everything uh, in your fleet operations from one central location, not only because you're using cloud or using 5G, but because you embrace global infrastructures that are scalable and elastic. So what we can do now is, um, so I wonder, you know, what can we do then? Can we just snap our fingers and we suddenly have this global fleet management um, that's driven by connected vehicle telematics? Um, yeah, sorry, that's not going to happen. Um, what, but what we can do is create a set of mechanisms, right? We can set, create a set of mechanisms that will enable you to marry these telematics with the cloud on your own terms. So now that we have an understanding of the why, um, we're going to move on with the what. Um, what we need uh, to make these cool new technical advances happen without recreating everything and delaying our projects. We don't want to have to be able to create all these little minuscule details from scratch. So let's first start at the edge side um, where we can talk about how this data gets generated and propagated up to the cloud, right? Because we because the data is coming from the physical assets that we're measuring. So as you're aware, um, there's no central brain that controls everything in the vehicle. There's many subsystems in the vehicle that work together. And really, that's, um, that's a good thing because it gives us flexibility and makes it so there's no single point of failure. Also, we want to make real consideration on the pitfalls of each of these subsystems not having hardened connectivity with one another. And that's really the reason why things like Canvas continues to be really, really popular. Um, you know, Ethernet has been growing in popularity um, due to the types of data that we're pushing around. But in any case, um, the telematics unit is usually responsible for communications between the vehicle and the outside world, specifically for fleet management. Um, and GPS data is usually needed for that. Um, so if the GPS peripheral is part of the TCU, that's fine, but if it's not, it needs to get that information via the canvas, right? So we have to have the mechanisms in place to achieve that. So when, um, why don't we do this? Why don't we take the magnifying glass to a basic telematic subsystem? And a couple of things here really, really stand out. Uh, it's the upstream and downstream communications that you see here. Um, the upstream communications is how the telematics subsystem is going to talk to the cloud. The downstream communications is how the device is going to talk with other subsystems in the vehicle. Uh, for telematics going to the cloud, the flow is from the left to the right. Uh, we're going to pick up the data from multiple sources, uh, the canvas, the Ethernet IP, and also local peripherals. Uh, the first step is the logger. The data will be coming in at a fast rate, um, and we need the mechanisms in place to buffer the data. Uh, then we need a series of readers that are more fine-tuned to pick up the data it needs to relay to the cloud. And also, um, we'll need the local persistence mechanism, right, in place in case of intermittent connectivity failure to the cloud. Um, then there will be an engine to route that data to the cloud, right? Because we need to take that data, put it up to the cloud. We need to have the mechanics in place in order to achieve that. Then, um, so that really brings me to my next point. I mean, if we're taking this data at a super fast rate, um, how fast really should we be sending that data? Um, we really need to think about that. So there's a lot of variables that require evaluation when you get to this point. Um, you need to, um, because uh, they require evaluation when you decide exactly what you want to propagate to the cloud. Um, but nothing constrains you um, what you send more than the communication module that you actually choose early in your design. 
Um, there are a few different parameters that go into making the choice. Um, first, what is the range that you need, right? Um, how much does it cost and is the technology available where you need to operate? For example, okay, if you're maintaining a fleet of scooters that operate in a municipality and you're operating under NBIOT or you're looking at operating under NBIOT and you don't have um, the need for sending high bandwidth data, that might be a good choice for you, right? NBIOT solutions usually cost lower on the power side as well. So that could persuade you to take the top swim lane, swim lane there. On the other hand, um, perhaps you want to develop a new system that sends telematics that also has the ability of transmitting video. Now, why would we want to do this? Um, perhaps we want to develop a system that is constantly taking video on a ring buffer or something like that. And, on, and when some event occurs, like someone backs into your vehicle in a parking lot, you can take the snapshot of video and send it over the wire. Well, is that classic telematics? Um, probably not, but we can bond these together for convenience if we want to. Um, but the payload is fatter, right? Um, we would likely transmit it to a different system um, than where the general telematics go to, right? Just because it's of a larger payload frame. So this is really telling us that the upstream communications module is going to set all these design boundaries down the road. It's not something that you can really have the luxury of choosing late in your design. So this presentation, um, <laughs> Well, it would be far from complete if I didn't mention the telematics profile in automotive grade Linux, right? The slide looks similar to the one a few back, um, but automotive grade Linux provides helper APIs for common tasks that you commonly see in telematics subsystems. These are really proving useful in helping us accelerate uh, telematics system development. We've been seeing this in, in AGL over the last year or so. Um, the first is the simplified bindings to the CAN bus. And this high level service provides a nice wrapper for CAN bus messages being transmitted on the wire between all the subsystems we were talking about earlier. The next is the simplified bindings for network configuration. It pains me to say this, but um, gateway commissioning can still be a painful experience for us. So one of the aspects of commissioning is network configuration. Um, and this network, this API wrapper for us, the conman bindings, um, really helps alleviate some of that pain. Now, you would think that would be natural to have a GPS binding in a telematics profile, right? Well, it's really not that simple. The GPS data can come from either the telematics peripheral itself, um, especially if it's an aftermarket's, um, aftermarket gateway, um, or from another subsystem like the navigation subsystem, for example. So we would need to implement that on our own. Um, coincidentally, that's exactly what we did for the demo you'll see later on uh, in, in this talk. So I'm going to switch gears just a tiny bit and talk about some cloud specific software that's provided for the edge that that helps things move forward so there's software named uh aws iot greengrass it's software right that extends cloud computing capability um, down to the edge uh, it allows you to develop serverless business logic using modern programming languages like python and java and c um, and if you're into node programming, then you can use that too. Um, these Lambda functions can be deployed to green grass without disrupting the firmware in the vehicle. This means that we don't actually have to do a firmware update to upgrade the software. This is a, actually a huge leap forward in agility for OEMs and has the potential to change 
the way these applications are developed on the edge. So OEMs are creating new electrical uh, architectures in their vehicles that leverage microbrokers that connect multiple components and sensors to fit for um, and sensors to a fit for purpose computing system in the vehicle. They're doing this um, using open source MQTT. Um, we'd like to take a bit of the work off their shoulders by providing us fully supported software components like Greengrass and FreeRTOS. And Greengrass can also route messages from one component to another and doesn't require cloud connectivity, which means it can operate in a disconnected state. And it's perfect um, for things like a vehicle, like if you're going between two cellular towers. Um, so as of our uh, re-event conference a couple of years ago, which is actually going on right now as we speak, um, we announced Greengrass machine, machine learning inference, right? So that means that you can train machine learning models up in the cloud and push them down to Greengrass on the edge. Um, and then you can actually do machine learning inference or, um, or other operations down there after you deploy it. So that really extends the value of what we're doing up in the cloud down to the edge. So why am I talking about this in the context of uh, telematics? Well, now that we have, um, we know about this cloud connectable software that we can run on automotive grade Linux, where does it fit into what we've been talking about? How does it, where does it run? Well, like we learned, Greengrass, um, it combines several components, right, into a single package that's delivered by the AWS cloud, and you can naturally get that as part of your image and run it in your TCU. But um, let's see where it fits here. Uh, actually, um, it, it actually covers quite a bit, but really it's from a component perspective, and I'll give you more clarity about that. Uh, going from left to right here, we'll see how this gets covered. From the bindings perspective, um, and also peripheral interfaces, Greengrass would interact with those. Uh, you would implement Lambda functions to integrate with these APIs. Uh, it's the same for the custom implementation down there for the GPS and so forth. Um, but why does it only cover half? Well, part of that either comes from the system, um, as part of the drivers or helper libraries or the telematics profile, which is not Greengrass. And the other part are the Lambda functions that would integrate with them. Um, for the logger, there are many choices ranging from the Greengrass Stream Manager uh, to using several RAM-based databases like Redis to persist data um, at intervals as necessary. Um, the Stream Manager feature in Greengrass gives some easy mechanisms to move data in a high bandwidth way through the system. Um, so, like I mentioned a bit previously, we don't want to send all the data up at once, right? Um, we want to create these readers using lambdas to work against the data source, and you can do them in those languages that I mentioned previously. Um, but once you've obtained your sample, you're either doing sampling or aggregation, then you can send along a green, what we call a Greengrass subscription to the router, um, which is the MQTT broker, and then you can propagate that to the AWS cloud. All right. So, uh, awesome. Um, Let's get into the cloudy stuff. Um, okay, well, that was quite a bit about the edge side of things. I, I hope that um, it was understandable um, what I was trying to get across. Um, now we want to take a look at the cloud side. Um, we're going to do this from a kind of abstract perspective so we can focus on the mechanisms rather than the, the literal cloud services. Um, then we could talk about specific cloud services after going through these concepts. Okay, so when you're sitting there, right? Why? Are you, because you're all wanting to do telematics. Um, when you're sitting there thinking of those amazing visions, right, of global fleet management dashboards, 
the mechanism that underscores or, or underpins these behaviors um, in the dashboard is the telematics and DTCs or diagnostic trouble codes. Um, those real-time feeds, right? That's what makes all those, those UIs happen. Um, but we can't have apps take those data flows uh, directly, right? Um, we need to get it to some kind of index storage in a consumable form. So let's, again, let's go from left to right. Um, let's walk how those messages flow. Like we learned in the edge section, we'll mostly be conversing over MQTT, right? So it's going to, this means that we're going to have um, some kind of IoT service ingest, something that has a managed MQTT broker up in the cloud. Um, this broker should be, high, of course, highly secure, scalable, resilient, because you're gonna have thousands of vehicles sending it data. Um, usually these managed services um, provide a way to um, route messages, right? Um, using very simple configuration between itself and the other services, um, just to reduce the amount of complexity in the configuration. Um, usually then we want to perform some compute on that or data cleansing or alerting at that level. Uh, the new fangled way uh, to handle this is with what we call serverless. Um, you can think of it as secured chunks of code floating in the cloud um, that you can invoke uh, to get work done in a distributed way. Now, depending on the type of message, we may want to implement a RESTful routing pattern to other serverless chunks of code so they can do their own specialized compute. But at some point though, you'll want that data to reach a repository. Um, a repository that can quickly index that data for visualization or rendering or even autom automation purposes, right? So simply when apps want to view the data, they'll look at that repository. Here we're using ElastiCache um, because it's open source and you can use other appropriate data stores as well. You don't have to use ElastiCache here, right? So there's another um, swim lane here that we should take a look at. Um, let's take a look at this for telematics. Remember what I said before, the cloud is for doing things at scale. So when we're doing anomaly detection um, in the cloud, we would likely be inferring outcomes across the whole fleet rather than a particular vehicle, right? So we're focused on a single vehicle and the inference model isn't too heavy. We can maybe do that at the edge, but usually we'll want to deal with a significant amount of data um, with on-demand compute, and that translates to cloud. Um, also, so there, there are other um, scenarios as well, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but just think of mass needing to do this at mass scale. But let's, again, um, let's go step by step. After the message makes it to the MQTT broker, Maybe we want to look for strange variations in oil temperature or other readings that could signal a chance for imminent equipment failure, right? There are algorithms that can take the data um, that are in like windows of time in the stream and compute on them, and which can give you the statistical result for that particular window, that sliding window. Um, that, could res that could surface an anomaly um, within system function, right? Once that anomaly is found, we would want to bucket that into an aggregation. Now, to be honest, uh, I'm a little bit mixed about this part of the diagram. It starts to get a little bit philosophical. How much of this data um, do I really want to collect? especially like what we saw in the previous slide, if I'm already capturing it in the real-time feed. In any case, we do need to eventually flag those anomalies and get them persisted into an index storage so we can do something um, with it later. <clears throat> and later we can use these as flags. Um, for example, um, if, there, if an anomaly found, is found with a particular vehicle, um, 
we may want to flag that for a mechanic. So why would we care about that? Why couldn't we just tell staff about the engine warning light that's gone on, like the driver comes in, parks the vehicle, says the engine light's gone on? Um, well, really, again, this comes down to optimization. If we can get a mechanic scheduled in advance of the vehicle arriving at the distribution center, we can optimize how fast we can get the vehicle on the road again. If the vehicle was brought in and no mechanics were available until the next day, then that vehicle would just sit. So we have an opportunity to optimize that when you have cloud-connected telematics. Um, next, let's talk about archiving. Um, telematics archiving is really your raw data lake. And everyone's heard a lot about data lakes, I'm sure. That initial pool, that's what it is. It's your raw data that you can tune and prune for machine learning and analytics and long-term auditing. This pipe, um, <coughs> excuse me, this pipe provides a fast and robust and cost-effective means of getting that data you need into the lake. Remember, that's a raw data unadulterated, right? You're not doing any um, changes to that data. You can do that in later stages. Um, of course, you can tune how much you're transmitting and persisting. Um, you also have the opportunity to do some cleansing um, after it's been put to rest. Um, but to, but um, let's deal with this step by step. OK, one moment. Um, let's deal with the step by step. We would have the data come into the IoT ingest point, right? Using MQTT once again. I don't need to go into that detail. I've already um, said that a few times. Um, but remember, when this data is coming through, it's doing it file. Well, I called it a file. It's an object. It's a chunk of data that we want to persist into our data lake, right? Now. You're looking at this diagram um, and saying, well, why do I need the streaming thing? Why can't I just take the data and put it into object storage directly? Well, the deal is, is that when you're taking data and you're putting it directly to object storage, many times that it can be considered inefficient because you're doing a data storage transaction for every single file, right? So um, because those those uh, object data storages are usually very um, highly resilient, right? So transactional stuff is um, a high priority. So don't get me wrong, it's still very fast, but we can do it better. Um, the streaming service uh, can be used um, in pairing with the object storage. So what a streaming service usually can do is take a whole bunch of objects and then batch persist it to object storage at larger intervals. So you're reducing the number of transactions and increasing the throughput to the object storage system. So just throw it to a stream, let the stream manage it in bulk and put it to the object storage system, which optimizes your archiving procedure. And um, Really, that's one of the reasons why the cloud really scales is because you're able to do really, really cool operations like that. Now, the last component, that major component that I want to talk about in the cloud is, um, <coughs> is um, this, the actionable dashboards. Um, we've done a lot with the data already, but now we need to do something interesting with that data. And at least in some cases, interesting things happen, uh, hopefully, when humans are involved, right? So uh, that means human interfaces, and um, but really, that's not the whole story here, because we have some non-human things that we need to do as well. So let's cover off the non-human part first. Um, the non-human part has to do with APIs that provide uh, not only the data interfaces um, for applications, but the mechanisms for reporting, like daily operational reports. Um, we could say this belongs in the fleet management UI, maybe, but really reporting could be a long process. And if we can avoid it, we wouldn't want um, to have a human perform the dull task of sitting there, hitting the run report button, and then just waiting, right? So we can batch that stuff. 
Um, but now we're going to get into the exciting parts, the human interfaces. Um, the fleet management UI is that beautiful single pane of glass that gives insights to your fleet. Um, you should be able to locate vehicles in real time, um, look at the vehicle properties, see what trip it's on, and all those other kind of cool things. Um, in the demo later, actually, you'll see that it's a fair, um, you'll see that kind of shininess and uh, of something called the connectivity management solution that we do here at AWS, and I'll be able to share that with you. Um, but it's like a bunch of JavaScript React coding, right? Really fancy, shiny stuff. Um, but there's other UIs too that are just as important um, because they get a lot of great things done. Um, for example, you may have a web UI that integrates for managing parts for your fleet. Um, you could have mobile apps that integrate into the system for your mechanics, like what we talked about earlier. So those are just as important. It's part of your overall operations. Um, but anyway, this is where, the, you know, we did all that work with the data so the humans could get to the data to make some really interesting decisions. All right. So um, next, what I want to talk about is bringing this, this all together. I talked about those, excuse me, <coughs> those two lower, low level parts, right? The edge and the cloud. Now what we want to do is bring those together. We've been through that journey of the why, the edge, the cloud details. Um, and we're going to walk this through again, one more time end to end, just so um, we have a high degree of certainty that we're sure that we know what we're, what we're thinking about this. Um, I just wanna bring all those details back to the surface for you. Um, also, before jumping into the demo, we'll do a walkthrough of the event pipeline because this might be interesting to you if you want to notify workers and how your operations are are going and um, any important events that may be happening in your fleet. So um, why don't we go ahead and get started with that? So um, let's go through this step by step going again from the left to the right, right? From the hardware to the cloud. Um, so we're going to go through it step by step. Um, remember, um, we're going to go, and um, when we're doing this, right, um, we're going to pair these mechanisms with actual AWS services, right? Because now we're going to look, start looking at concrete implementation, um, how we can use these cloud services. So down here at the edge, the Telemax data um, is collected from the canvas or peripherals, and it can be decoded or deserialized at the edge and then published over MQTT, right? So that's the first step. Um, or it could be published raw and transformed in the cloud. You can make that decision too. Um, the way that the connectivity management solution works, which is this framework that I'll be showing you in the demo, is we use JSON over MQTT, but I think something like BSON might be good too. We just haven't really dove into that yet. Um, we, re we recommend using the MQTT protocol since it's lightweight and supports those pub sub mechanisms, right? That's what we've been talking about. Now, in the case where you, maybe you have a dev device where you want to use HTTP, instead. Well, yeah, sure, the AWS cloud, the AWS IoT supports HTTPS and also web sockets. But in the case that we're talking about today, I don't want to pollute or, or um, make that <laughs> um, more cloudy. So let's just focus on what we've been talking about so far, which is IoT Greengrass running on the TCU. And that's going to end up saving us a lot of implementation time um, for those details. So now the TCU is um, pushing telematics to the cloud, right? And IoT Core, that's what the service is called, uses rules engine, which is, we, and in that is an IoT rule, to route things to different black, um, backends. So remember the first stage we went through, which was um, 
well, it was actually a later stage. Um, the archive telemetry, right? So let's go through archive telemetry. That data would be coming full blast in from many angles as a number of vehicles in your fleet. So we need to have a wide pipe. That's handled by um, a service named uh, Kinesis Data Firehose, um, which is super scalable, streaming solution. Um, it takes raw data, it's archived into an S3 data lake um, for regulatory or analytics or anything you'd like to do with that raw data, um, data lake data, okay? So next we have the anomaly detection, which is performed in near real time. This was um, the second part that we talked about. And um, you can use the algorithm. So this is really, this is really a cool thing. We're using streaming, but what we can actually do is run analytics on the data as it's streaming, right? So we, the the pattern that we typically talk to customers about is using a random cut forest algorithm with Kinesis Analytics. Um, yeah, we can produce, we can just do that right on the fly, on the streaming data. And that gives you the wide scale that you really need. Um, that can be further tuned and then um, before for um, hitting the DynamoDB database, which is the NoSQL database, and then going to Amazon Elasticsearch. So next um, is the telemetry and the DTCs um, and the driver score computations, right? Um, the, nowadays, um, the trip data and driver score, that's a pretty standard metric that you want to be able to compute and, and display and report on. And you can do it through that particular event event pipeline. So that can be processed through Lambda and persisted to a DynamoDB table. All this information is in a raw and aggregated form and is stored in Elasticsearch for consumption through APIs or UIs. Now, of course, your workload may need to evolve um, some of these components that we're talking about based on your use case. The CMS doesn't force you to use any specific components. Um, it's an excellent starting point um, based on the customer engagements that we've had. Um, however, the way some fleets operate could lead to um, using alternate AWS services. So of course you have to always go through a design and evaluation phase on exactly what you're using. Um, for example, if you don't need the data immediately, in some cases it might be okay to implement batch processes, right? Now after all that, um, then users can view the data. And um, and there's a good starting point for use in the CMS that I'll show you in a little bit, um, which you'll be able to see in the demo coming up. So next I'm gonna show you something that we haven't really talked about yet, which is um, event data, right? Because it's not one of those core pipelines that we we're talking about, but this is something that I like talking to people that could be derived, um, talk to people about that could be derived from telematics data and could be useful in your case. So for event processing, right, there's a workflow built that you can leverage within the connected connectivity management solution using AWS Lambda and the simple notification service, which is um, just a messaging um, service in the AWS cloud. Um, this event processor, this is an event processing pipeline, um, can receive events from event sources like IoT Core and DynamoDB streams. Um, the subscriber on the right-hand side over there um, defines the filters for the events, okay? So those are your SNS subscriptions and generate alerts based on, on those settings. Um, that's a really, really great way to cheaply and quickly integrate events into the connectivity management solution. Of course, like anything else at AWS, um, there are approaches to achieving this outcome that has its own trade-offs, right? So like I said, this pipeline is easy to manage. Um, however, if you like to do larger scale event orchestration, you might want to be um, or implement something maybe a little bit more savvy, like using IoT events, which is in the IoT suite of services. And you would just evaluate to see if those set of features would actually fit your particular use case. That's kind of the cool thing about the cloud. There's usually an array of things to choose from um, to fit your case. Um, and that would help you build a really cool state machine that could help you manage your fleet. 
But right now we're going to keep it simple. There's a few different services that can work the event pipeline right here. Um, you to learn more about that over time. Right. Okay, cool. So now um, what we're going to do next is run through a demo of this end-to-end -end solution. I actually don't know um, exactly how we're doing on time. I think we might be doing okay. Um, or a little bit on time. So let me just get through this. Um, the demo is just going to take about four minutes and it's recorded, okay? And there's a lot of moving pieces on the edge of the cloud, so let's jump right into it. Um, it's a video, it's on YouTube, so you can watch it later if you want to. Um, so I'm really excited to demonstrate this to you. Um, So what we're going to be using is the Renaissance R car in the AWS cloud to build your next generation, right? Automotive gateway solution. That's the thing that I've been talking about here. Um, and we're using for a very, very basic prototype and then move on to the software integration side. And then finally to how the R car um, delivers data to the AWS cloud. So it's the, let me see how far away we are. Okay. So um, I'm using the H3, um, the Renaissance R-Car H3 starter kit, right? And I just, sorry, I just lost control of my screen for a second there. Um, what I wanted to say is that it, I'm just gonna go back a little bit if I can. I think the video is really playing. <laughs> so I'll just say that I was using the MTK3339 GPS module uh, on the video um, with the USB Wi-Fi dongle. And to get this all running, I had to do three basic steps. Um, I needed to integrate the software stack to the RCAR image. The RCAR naturally runs AGL automotive grade Linux. Um, so what we'll want to do is um, produce the AGL demo along with IoT Greengrass. Um, to do that, We'll build it using Meta AWS, which is the BitBake layer that we have up on GitHub. Um, and then once the build completes and is flashed to the device or is running on micro SD, we need to provision the device, right? When we do this in production, um, we'll probably want to use an automotive grade TPM, right? But right now we're going to commission and provision manually. Um, I can, um, create the credentials on the command line and also create and deploy IoT Greengrass group on the on the command line. So now what we can do is reboot the device and the device connects automatically to the AWS cloud. I'm doing some Wi-Fi configuration here. Um, we have our GPS connected, but right now nothing is reading the data, okay? So what we can do is write some code for the GPS using AWS Lambda. Um, we can deploy that cloud, that code from the cloud to the device. And this is the deployment process here in using Greengrass. So I'm starting the deployment. And once Lambda function has been deployed, IoT Greengrass can start reading the GPS data and relaying that to the cloud. Now, of course, you might not um, want to send the GPS raw data to the cloud. So Lambda function would massage that data first um, and send only the most essential data that you need to um, reduce costs. So what we can do then is view the telematic um, data in the fleet manager user interface, which I'm logging into right now. After logging in, you can drill down to the specific vehicles. And in this case, uh, it's the R car that has the GPS sitting on my desk. So you're seeing kind of where I live. And um, what I'm doing right now is um, changing the heading of the GPS device. Um, the data is going through the pipeline we talked about. So you have the GPS data for later analysis, right? So um, for more information about integrating the R car, you can browse the Meta AWS project and the Meta AWS demos walkthrough for the Renaissance R car, right? 
And so those are the links there that you can go and check out. So that's it. That went a little bit speedy, and I think I lost my pointer. One second. Okay. I'm just going to have to manually do my pointer. Um, throughout, okay, so throughout the session, um, you witness the use of a lot of resources, right, that are brought together to make all this technology possible. On the device side, we used automotive grade Linux to build in AWS IoT Greengrass using the Meta AWS project. Um, we also have a walkthrough for the Renaissance RCAR H3 on Meta AWS demos. Um, right now, the repo isn't live, but we should, um, it should be live in the next couple of weeks. It's the usual procedure here at AWS. If you're interested in that, um, just follow me on LinkedIn or GitHub and you'll be able to know when it becomes, becomes available because I'll announce it there. Um, last but not least, if you're interested in the connected mobility solution that I talked about, you can reach out to the, on this, on the last URL here, and that will get you to the right people if you'd like to do that. Um, but if you do that, don't mention, I mean, don't forget to mention that you saw it during the session. All right. And with that, um, I would like to say thanks again for taking the time of watching this presentation. I know there's a lot of uh, great presentations going on. Thank you so much. And please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. If we have time for questions, please don't be shy and ask away. Um, for example, if you're interested in what the code looks like or um, how it's getting um, GPS data information, I can show you that and um, how it's configured in AWS. We'll see how much time we have left. And that's it, thank you. Um, I'm not, let me see if I can. Oh, I have some messages. <laughs> I have to figure out how to use this thing. One second. I think I think what we can do is if what I can do is stop the session and then if you have any questions you can reach out to me at the um at the two track automotive limit Linux summit channel and we can go and you can um ask me for questions there I'll be there for a while okay so thank you so much. Um, have a great conference. Bye.